Hi there, my name is Professor Peter Mumby. I'm at the University of Queensland and I'm also an adjunct research fellow at the Palau International Coral Reef Centre. I've been associated with the centre since 2006 when I first came to do a, a start a remote sensing project but it got me really interested in a whole bunch of ecological questions that I've been pursuing with collaborators at the centre ever since. And one of the first projects we did was a collaboration with uh, Dr. Golbu, uh, looking at the effect of fishing on herbivorous species like parrotfish, surgeonfish, uh, across Micronesia. And it revealed some really interesting patterns. For example, that uh, in places in Guam, that that some of the largest uh, unicorn fish were being caught there, but people were scuba diving to a depth of about 150 feet to access them, which was hugely dangerous. Um, whereas in Palau, of course, the catch was much more modest. Um, I did some work there with various students. Uh, one of the things we looked at in that fishery question was which species of parrotfish uh, were being targeted. And um, clearly there are some species that are very heavily targeted, but some of the most ecologically important species uh, most of the fishes are sort of ambivalent about. They, they don't really target them, but that they will take them if they can get them opportunistically. And that gave some kind of opportunity to maybe diversify people away from some of the most sensitive species. So this was all a great introduction to understanding reefs in Palau. Um, and so after that, I've been doing a variety of studies. And the reason that my team uh, work with the centre um, is... Partly because, you know, Palau allows you to ask so many interesting and important questions, uh, not just for Palau, but more broadly as well. Um, I often, when I'm justifying things in Australia to colleagues who say, why aren't you using our research stations on the Great Barrier Reef more often? I say, well, you know, in Palau, um, we've got great partners. Um, we have great facilities there and we can access a whole range of environments within maybe 20 minutes. We can be in a place that's got a sewage pollution problem. We can be studying uh, mangrove watersheds. We can be going to really pristine areas. We can go to rubble areas that have been damaged. All of that within a very short space of time. So it offers a lot of flexibility. And of course, there's some very important questions in Palau regarding the fisheries that are there, the reef fisheries in particular and the processes that govern reef recovery. Uh, and Palau's interesting in that way because uh, it has a very well-studied uh, recovery history. I mean, the big disturbance that occurred in 1998 during that massive coral bleaching event um, led to a fairly long period of recovery. And when I started studying reefs in 2006 there, um, the reefs around uh, Nadarak, which is, of course is a taboo uh, protected area, were still sort of rubble based and they were consolidating, but there was still not a massive recovery of coral yet. Um, and that happened a few years later and it suddenly just went boom and the corals recovered. And I've been studying the recovery with the center at Nadarak now for uh, over 14 years. And it's it's taught us so much. It's sort of taught us that it can take maybe eight years for broken rubble uh, from dead coral to consolidate and then allow recovery. But it's now teaching us some interesting questions about reef recovery that we'd never really anticipated. And so one of the most remarkable things I see is when you look at that extra, that stretch of reef from Nadarak down to the Lighthouse Reef, um, they were impacted at the end of 2012 by uh, the, the typhoon. And the recovery has been fascinating because initially there was a bloom of seaweed and it's taken a, quite a while for that to, the impact of that to go away. For several years, corals wouldn't settle on those reefs. They wouldn't recover because there was quite a large amount of this um, cryptic brown seaweed called Lobophora on the reef. And then in about 2015, we'd gone out to Lighthouse Reef for the first time on that trip and one of my staff jumped in the water and then he started sort of shouting and, uh, and, and, and moving about and creating a scene. And I thought he might be being attacked by a shark or something. And what had happened is he'd gone in to look at the reef 
and it suddenly started showing this amazing recovery. And we got in the water and looked at it and just thought, oh my God, what's, what's happening here? This reef is recovering incredibly quickly, but it's taken so long before that was going to start. And so it waited and waited and waited, and then boom, it recovered incredibly quickly. Whereas the reefs to the north, just a kilometre or two to the north in, the, in Nadarak, were showing virtually no signs of recovery. And that sort of leads us to some very interesting questions about, you know, what is it that drives that sort of very variable pattern of coral recovery? Because Lighthouse, which always seemed to be a sort of not terribly exciting reef to go and dive on, I mean, you wouldn't get many tourists going there, has now turned into something truly spectacular and worthy diving. Whereas other places still look like they're in the early stages of recovery. And so this has been a, a question that we've been collaborating um, with centre staff on. And in fact, during COVID, um, we we jointly put out some coral settlement tiles earlier in 2020 to start studying whether the problem was actually a lack of coral larval supply. And of course, uh, post-COVID, um, the experiment was now in the water waiting for us to go and monitor and, and collect the tiles, look at how many young corals there were and understand what's the process of recovery. And that's all been led by our partners at the centre. And um, we, we talk frequently about it and, um, you know, it just shows how strong those partnerships are when it really doesn't matter if, if we're there from Australia or not. The work will get done and there's enthused and interesting people to work on that. So that's one of the great examples of the partnership, I think. Um, some other things we've been working on relatively recently is, is taking forward some of the work that Dr. Goldberg did during his PhD, where he was showing some of the impacts of sediment along the um, west coast of Bubbledop, where there is a lot of runoff of sediment from rivers into the lagoon. And one of the questions that he was left with was saying, you know, he thinks this is going to have an impact on coral recovery. So we've been able to ask that question now and, and get some answers and absolutely that that sediment that runs off is reducing coral recruitment and stopping corals recovering as you get closer to land. Um, one good thing that emerged from that work though is that the levels of sediment coming in today are considerably better than they were 10 years ago or so when uh, Dr Gobble was doing his work so that sort of improvement of the watershed is certainly having some benefits but there's still the potential for some impacts there and we also see that the ability for corals to recover is much poorer if you fish the herbivorous species out at the same time so if you've got an overfishing problem on herbivores plus sediments entering the water then coral recovery will be vastly reduced which of course is a problem because those corals provide the habitat for much of the fish that you want to harvest as well as, of course, providing coastal protection and the habitat for so much biodiversity, not to mention attracting tourists. The other area that we are really interested in and have been working with the centre on increasingly is in the, the fisheries, some of the, particularly the group of fishery. Um, and we've been doing some work that's still ongoing, looking at the vulnerability of those grouper aggregation sites around Ebiol and other sites to exploitation because Palau is unusual in that the primary means of fishing some of those grouper is during their um, spawning aggregations. So those aggregations are fished and there's some ongoing work by the Nature Conservancy and we've been partnering with them informally and with the centre of course um, and now uh, working on can we reconstruct that fishery? Can we explain how that fishery is changing and what might be sustainable levels of exploitation? Um, and this is a really important question and it's great to see now that the centre is taking a lead role in monitoring some of those harvested aggregations as well as the ones that are protected. And this is an ongoing collaboration that we have. So, you know, for me, uh, I very much love working with my colleagues at the centre I miss Palau, it's been uh, nearly a year now since I've been able to get out there. Um, I love to see that the centre is getting busier and busier with researchers, but I'm also pleased to see that there's been an increasing kind of focus of the centre on really important issues for Palau today. I mean, obviously there's the, the whole uh, sanctuary 
but increasingly I think that the center has an important role in understanding the fishery effects and coral recovery effects that influence local tourism but also local people's livelihoods and access to fish. I think that that's easily overlooked in a number of countries and that the centre are perfectly placed to do that and I hope we can carry on working together in doing that. Thanks a lot.